Kingdom kids. Good job, good job, good job. Thank you, Tina. And coming up for our scripture reading. Here you go. Thank you. I'll be reading from Acts 4, verses 32 to 37. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of the Lord. Let's start with prayer, shall we? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this example of a community that shares. Lord, I pray that you will be speaking to us through this time, that you'll be challenging us, but that you'll also be comforting us as we talk about being a sharing community and what that looks like. Lord, we pray for your Holy Spirit to be here, working amongst us. Amen. Okay, today we're continuing with the theme of a community. Today we're talking about a sharing community. And hopefully the mic will keep working okay. I don't know about you, but the verses that we just read are a beautiful picture of a community. When I hear these verses, I think of maybe a small town, a small village somewhere, people who live close enough to each other that they can walk to one another's houses. You know, maybe auntie pops in with a meal that she's cooked. A child runs next door with some eggs and vegetables, sharing everything that they have and being together. And some of us may have heard stories from our grandparents of a life that used to be like that. But when we look at our life now in Sydney and what it's like in our day-to-day, with long commutes, long work hours, living far away from family and friends sometimes, having to drive everywhere, it can be a little bit hard to relate to this community. It's a wonderful thing and it's an important part of who we are. But how do we do it in this day and age? What does it look like? And I think, too, sometimes when people think about the church, because the church is our community, we also have baggage that we bring with us. What is the church? What does it look like? What do we expect from it? Is it a building? Is it a thing that we do on Sundays? We come in, we stand in rows, we sing, we sit down, we pray and we listen to someone. Is that church? Is it a club or an organisation where we hang out with people and have fun? Is it some massive institution that will never change? We all have a concept of church that we bring when we come and we think about our community and sometimes that gets in the way. It's often shaped by our experiences and for many of us we come here because We know that it's a supporting, loving environment where we can meet Jesus and we can meet other people who are also followers of Jesus. But the reality is that for some people, the church is a place where they've felt hurt. And for some people, coming to church is coming to a place where you have to pretend everything's okay. Jesus loves me, therefore I should be happy, so I'm going to pretend to be happy in front of everybody around me. I'm not sure that that's what Jesus wants from his church. It's actually pretty simple to break down what it is that Jesus said about the church because actually he never used the word church. 
Jesus didn't teach us how to organise ourselves as his followers, as a community. He taught us how to be disciples. And last week Sam talked quite a bit about this when he was talking about being a serving church. Serving comes out of our discipleship. How we follow Jesus, how we practice our faith, And when we hear this story of the early church, we have to remember this happened immediately after Pentecost. So it started with a filling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came into people and transformed them completely. By being transformed by the Spirit, Jesus' disciples were able to live in a new way. They were able to live out what Jesus taught. When we think about um, what Jesus taught, we have to remember that he had certain things that he put before us that were challenging. Sometimes we can read the passages that are easy, but Jesus would challenge people all the time. And he taught us to share. He taught us to be there for the needy in our community. Matthew 25, 35 to 40 was a story that Jesus was telling. It said, For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick in prison and go and visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whenever you do this for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you do it for me. He challenged us to live a new way. He also challenged us to be loving and to be caring because sharing comes out of love. If serving comes out of discipleship, sharing comes out of love. You're not going to go out to dinner with somebody you love and not share with them, not share time with them, not share the things that you have with them. And Jesus gave us the greatest commandment. What was the greatest commandment? Tell me, what was it? So your heart, mind, and the other was like it. What is that? Love others as you love yourself. This is what Jesus was about. It's very, very simple. Being a sharing community is about loving one another in the same way that Jesus taught us to. As I said, serving one another is part of um, a natural flow on from our discipleship and loving one another happens, sorry, sharing with one another happens when we love one another. I want to share some things with you today. Recently, I had the opportunity to go to Bulgaria. Now, a year ago, I would not have been able to find Bulgaria on a map And I assume that pretty much everybody in this room would be the same, let alone think that I would ever go to Bulgaria as a country. Well, I should have put a map up there. Bulgaria is actually just north of Turkey and right next to um, Greece. And on the other side is Romania and above is Serbia. So it's a really small country in that southern part of Europe. Now, when I travel to Europe, I've only done it twice now, but my biggest fear is the jet lag. I don't know if you've travelled to the other side of the world. Sometimes I feel enough jet lag if I go to Perth. But going to Europe, that sense of I'm just going to be so tired and I had to work while I was there. So I wanted to make sure that I could recover from the jet lag. So I gave myself an extra day before I started work. Naturally, the jet lag meant I woke up completely awake 6 a.m. That extra day was... um, Helpful in some ways, but the tiredness didn't hit until late afternoon. Early in the morning, I was just so awake. It's not just about the tiredness. So I thought, okay, 
I've now got a day, I've got some time, I'm going to go out and explore the capital a bit, I'm by myself. I hadn't really done any research on tourist spots. I had really researched stuff about the country, but it was nothing to do with what was in the city that I could go and see as a tourist. So I thought, I'll just go for a walk, get a feel for this city. So I, I came out of my hotel in downtown Sofia. Sofia's only got about one million people, so it's a much smaller city than Sydney. Turned right, walked 100 metres, and came across some Roman ruins. Now, that was something I did not expect. I thought, yes, maybe old churches, something Bulgarian, traditional. It used to be a communist country. Maybe communist stuff would be there. But no, the first thing I came across was Roman ruins. And I looked around, and there was no entrance fee. There was nobody there except me. There were all these people rushing past, going to the metro, which was right next to it. And so I thought, wow. I can just walk around Roman ruins. I can walk on this Roman road. There was nothing stopping me. And, um, and I did. It was amazing. So I thought, oh, this is cool. I'm going to keep going, see what else I can find. So I got out Google Maps because I didn't want to get lost in a strange city. And I looked for the closest tourist destination to where I was. And it was just two blocks away. So I walked along and I came across this. This is a church. It's called um, Church of St. George Rotunda, which basically means it's the round St. George Church. And I thought, interesting. Okay. I'll, obviously an old church, and it's marked on Google Maps as a tourist destination, and it says that it's open at this time. So I looked around. There was nobody around anywhere. I went up to the front door, no signs, nothing, and I thought, Google Maps says it's open. When's Google wrong? So I opened the front door very, very gently, stuck my head in. There was one lady sitting inside in a little booth. And she was selling books and pamphlets, and she didn't speak any English, but she had a pamphlet in English. There was no entrance fee. It's still a functioning church, um, but we, I could go in and have a look around. So I bought the English pamphlet because I thought, oh, I want to learn something about this place. Turns out this is one of the first ever churches in the world. It was built in 311 AD. It was built the year that a Roman emperor declared tolerance for different religions, which meant it was the very first year that Christianity as a religion was legal. Until that time, the church had been meeting in homes. Until that time, the church had been meeting by the river. Paul was preaching in synagogues, we read throughout the book of Acts. But this is the first time that they could actually have public church buildings where people could get baptised, get married, be buried, and gather together as a church in a public place. It blew my mind that I was standing in one of the very first churches in the world. This church was also particularly built as a Roman bar because as soon as Christianity was made legal, a whole lot of people came to faith, people who were interested in Christianity but hadn't made the decision to follow Jesus because it wasn't legal. So one of the first ever churches was built as a Roman bath to baptise people. That blew my mind. One of the first reasons they needed a church was because so many people were coming to faith. There was another church in the city built around the same time where um, there were a lot of graves. It was a place where people could be buried as a Christian. But, yeah, in 311 AD. I kept reading, though. It was uh, fascinating stuff. At that time, the city of Sofia was actually called Sertica. And Sertica is actually an important part of church history. Not only was it one of the first Roman cities where um, Christianity was legalised, it was also a city where in 343 AD, leaders from all over the Roman Empire came together for a conference. And it's really, really important because 
in this conference, they did not meet. They had a conference where people did not come face to face because they were arguing. They were arguing over theology. They were arguing over the Trinity and the role of the Holy Spirit. And this conference was part of the whole situation that led to the split in the church between the Western church, the Catholic church at that time, and the Eastern Orthodox church. It was the first major denominational split 32 years after a church was built to baptise hundreds of people. That same church became the place where people were arguing over theology. It's a very interesting place. On the inside, it looks like this. It's pretty much empty in the middle. They don't do church like we do in Eastern Orthodox churches. It's open because people come in at any time to pray and they will go around and there's pictures of the saints and they will stand and pray in front of those pictures. It's not a place where you sit and listen the way you guys are sitting and listening right now. You can see there's paintings on the wall. Over the centuries, different eras of the church um, painted um, pictures of angels, pictures of saints, And there were like three layers that had worn away. It became a mosque for a little while when the Ottoman Empire invaded and then was returned to being a church again in more recent years. So after that, I decided I'm going to keep walking through this city. This is interesting. And two blocks away, I came across another church. This is a Russian Orthodox church. Very fancy, very, very fancy. Um, I walked inside and it was actually quite dark. You can see in the pictures there the interior is dark. I was not allowed to take photos. I got these photos off the internet. So um, in places like this you can't actually take photos of the interior, but other people did. And when I was there, (laughs) when I was there I could hear a priest chanting. Okay, I can't get the sound to work. In the bottom left-hand corner of the slide, I don't know if you can press the play. No. Okay, anyway, for me, I actually walked into the middle of a service and I was like, whoa, am I allowed to be here? Um, I'm not sure if I was or not, but I was. And in this church... um, what was happening was the priest was down the front and he was singing. It was Byzantine chanting um, and it was beautiful. I thought it was a recording, but then he coughed halfway through, so I knew that he was actually (laughs) singing. And it, it um, it was obviously a prayer and he was um, doing something with incense as well. There were only six people in the church as part of the service they were praying. One man was standing to one side and he leaned right down and then he got down onto the floor, bowing down to pray. Another woman stood on the other side and she went up to one of the pictures of the saints and she kissed the picture of the saint and then stood in front of it praying. It was fascinating. Again, there weren't chairs in front to to sit and to listen. People didn't stand and sing together. Church was done in a very different way. So after that little bit of education, I thought, okay, time to keep walking. My time is limited. I went on across um, a big park and there was another church, this one, the cathedral. I've decided that Sophia is a city of churches. There were churches everywhere. This one was St. Alexander Nevsky Cathedral. It was built at the beginning of the 20th century. And this was a different experience again for me. When I walked into it, this is what I saw. Again, not my picture, stolen from someone else. But when I walked into the church, oh my goodness, I was suddenly filled with memories of things that I had read about the temple. The ceiling was so high, like 
I've got no idea how high, just incredibly high. It was a massive space. Everything was gold or marble. Everything was just shining. There were these chandeliers. There were these golden lampstands. And it made me think of Solomon's temple. In 1 Kings 6.21, it said, Solomon covered the inside of the temple with pure gold and he extended gold chains across the front of the inner sanctuary which was overlaid with gold. It was stunning. And it's not like anything I had seen in Australian churches ever. And it made me think of God as king. It was like walking into a palace, into a place where a king might sit. There were even thrones at the front, which is where the bishops sit in an Orthodox church. In Revelation 21, it talks about the new Jerusalem shining with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, I think sometimes as Australians, we don't get the majesty of God. We don't get that sense of awe that I felt when I walked into this space. But again, the space was mostly empty. This time there were actually a few other tourists. I wasn't the only one. But it was empty. Let's go back. Straight after being at the cathedral, my colleague picked me up, took me out for lunch, I didn't get to eat lunch. I actually skipped lunch. Because the next church that he took me to was this one. This is Street Mercy. This is um, a van that the organisation I work for drives into downtown Sofia. It's right next to the train station. And every single day, volunteers from the Baptist church come and we deliver food to the homeless. This man in a wheelchair was a really friendly guy, except his dog was not friendly. He said the um, mother of the dog used to be very friendly, but this one guards him, so we couldn't get too close. You can see in the bottom picture um, that bread and the two bowls of soup that had been made. The guy in the blue T-shirt in the middle there um, of both of those pictures The one on the left, you can see he's preaching. He's actually a pastor, but he's also the man who drives the van. So his is a church that comes in a van. And all the people gathered around him. When he stood out there, all these mostly men, but also some women, quite a few of them older, gathered around and listened. They were ready to listen. And he shared from the gospel. I think he shared from John that day. I can't really tell you because I don't speak Bulgarian. But um, his, everybody seemed really intent on listening. And then he prayed and they prayed with him. And then the ladies that you see on the right there, they're volunteers from the Baptist church. They, um, they get different volunteers every single day. So people around the church share it out. And Baptist church in Bulgaria, I've got to say, is very, very small. There's very few Baptists there. But they were sharing out the soup and the bread to everybody. There was fellowship, there was warmth, there was the gospel. And when I think about this church as opposed to the other churches, the contrast is so stark. You know, you've got the first church where there were all these baptisms, but it was then a place of conflict. You had the Orthodox churches that proclaimed God's glory, and God is king, but hardly anyone was there. And then you've got the church that is in the back of a van where they stand on the street and they share the reality of life together. I was really humbled just watching them and being a part of what they were doing. 
I think theology is important. I think God is most definitely king. But I think this is the sort of community that Jesus wants for his people. This is what he was teaching about. This is how he did things. He didn't stay in the church. He didn't have a building. He walked the streets and he spoke to people in need. So here's the passage again. What are the things that they were actually sharing? What did it mean to be this sharing community? Firstly, they were sharing heart and mind. They were of one heart and mind. They weren't just sharing stuff. They were sharing who they were. They did share their stuff. And that's a challenge for our culture. In our culture, we don't, like, what we earn is for us. We look after our own first. But they shared all of their possessions, everything they had. They testified to the resurrection of Jesus. They shared their faith. They shared what God had done for them. Now, there is a passage almost identical to this one two chapters earlier where it says, along with all the sharing, that people came to faith every single day. And it's not because they were just sharing their stuff. They were also sharing about Jesus and why Jesus had transformed their lives. They were sharing God's grace. They were sharing their land and their houses, their money. And then you've got Joseph, who was called Barnabas because he shared encouragement so often. And he also shared his money. So what about us? What do we share? What can we share? I think sometimes it's not always easy. But there are many of those things that we can share. We can share our stuff. That's one of the things we teach kids from the time they're really little. Share your toys. Don't hit somebody else over the head with it. Don't snatch it away. At least I tried to teach my kids that. I don't know if I succeeded. We can share our money. We have more than we need. We can share. We can share our time. That can be a real challenge in Sydney because many of us are time poor and somebody who shares time with you, that is special. We can share our hearts, our faith, our hope. We can share our testimony. Now, these are things that sometimes we know we should share, but it's not easy. Because when you're sharing your heart with someone, there's always that risk of rejection. And there's always a sense of, I don't know if they want to hear. But we have the opportunity and we can share it when we have the opportunity. We might be asked to share our space. Now, I used to work in an office where um, there was a lot of tension and politics around who got to share offices with who because there wasn't enough offices for everybody to have their own. And then it was like, oh, some people actually have to share a desk. How hard is it to share? How gracious are we when we're forced to share our space and our homes? Our homes are the place we retreat to at the end of a busy day. It's where we let our hair down. It's where we relax. It's not easy to open up our homes. We had people over last night for the first time in ages. You've got to clean the house. You've got to prepare the food. It's not always easy to share our homes with people. But it's such a blessing when we do. We can share our knowledge, our wisdom. We can share our story. One thing we don't always want to share is our struggles. Because if we're truly going to be a sharing community, you can't just share the good things that you have. You actually have to break down barriers. You have to build trust with one another and that only happens when we also share the struggles. Because for some people, 
their time is worn out, their energy is worn out, their wisdom and knowledge feels like it's just depleted and the only thing they've got to share are their struggles. But when we share our struggles, it creates an opportunity for someone else to understand and be a blessing. It creates an opportunity for the community to be a community, to be Christ to one another. And when we share our struggles, it creates a space where it's permissible for other people to admit their struggles too. Because if I stand up here and say, oh, my life is all together, that just makes everybody feel bad. But when I am honest about the fact that not every day is good, not every day I am a good Christian, I cannot pray every day, I cannot be gracious in every moment, then that gives other people hope that they can also be a follower of Jesus without being perfect. We need to share our struggles as much as we need to share our money in order to be a sharing community, to be a real, authentic community. We need to share life, and that's why we have life groups. Because when there's, we're sitting like this, it's not easy to share life. It's easier to share life out there, having morning tea. It's easier to share life when we're in each other's homes. It's easier to share life when we've got time and we're talking. So what stops us from sharing? Now, I'm going to admit this right now. I brainstormed the things that stopped me from sharing. You might have completely different things, but my list was long enough all by myself. So I assume that some of you might share the same sorts of struggles that I have. And I, as I looked at my list, I, I realised there's two types. There's the what-ifs and then there's the assumptions that I make. What if sharing means that I won't have enough for myself to retire on? What if I don't have enough to, to live with, to pay the bills? What if I don't have enough for that next holiday? What if people take advantage of me if they know that I'm a generous person and they keep coming back and asking for more? What if somebody closer to me needs it more than this other person? My children, what are they going to miss out on if I share? What if I share my faith with someone and they reject me? What if I share my struggles with someone and I appear weak? What if I share my weaknesses and they use it against me? And then the assumptions. They don't really need it. Someone else will help. We're a big congregation. Somebody else will do it. Everybody I know is like me. We all have enough. We all work. We're doing pretty well. Nobody else around me needs it. They wouldn't be interested. If I shared my faith, they really wouldn't be interested. They have other people in their life. They may not want to share time with me, even if I want to share time with them. They're too busy. They don't want to hear what I have to say. And when I look at that list of mine, I don't know whether yours matches or not. I realise there are two things going on here. One is that I don't share because I want to protect myself. I want to look after my family. I want to look after my needs. And I don't share because I don't see the needs of other people. Now, the real reason that I went to Bulgaria for work was to see the needs in Bulgaria because I had no idea the extent of poverty in Europe. My job is to work for an organisation that um, raises funds for people in poverty in Eastern Europe. And our aim is to journey with those families long term so that they become self-sufficient. We do it all in partnership with churches. 
So um, when I was going there, I was meeting people from churches. I was seeing the work they did. And they showed me families in need who were either right at the beginning of their journey with the organisation, but also some at the other end. So I want to share some of these stories with you because I think sometimes we live in a nice, really comfortable bubble here in Sydney and we don't realise the needs in the world. This house in the bottom right there, um, the top left side up there, that's actually the interior of that house. So this is a family who um, is brand new to the organisation. They were only just starting to get food parcels delivered to them monthly. Have a good look at it. Um, it's a one-roomed house. There is only one room and it's probably about the size of my kitchen. There were four people living there. And if you look carefully at the photos, you can see that there are holes in the wall. The weather is not kept out. And in this part of Bulgaria, the temperature gets down to minus 20 degrees Celsius. The snow blows in. It's cold. On the bottom left, you can see right in the bottom right corner of that picture, there's um, a 44-gallon drum. That is the heating for the house. They put firewood in there and burn it. There's um, this interesting silver pipe that they had going out the back and out through the wall for the smoke to go out, so they kept the house clean. So the smoke was taken out. That is also their kitchen. They live in a one-room house where they've got two beds, a cupboard, and this heater. So they do all their cooking on top of this 44-gallon drum because they don't have anything else to cook with. They don't always have electricity. The wire that's hanging down there, they're borrowing electricity from their neighbours. Um, as in, they don't pay for electricity, so sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't, and they only get it when they're stealing it. So it's pretty much just a light bulb hanging from the ceiling. They have no bathroom in the house. All they have is an outdoor toilet. And imagine what it's like going to use it when it's minus 20 degrees. There is no running water. They get their water from a well. They have to go out of the house to get their water. Which means that hygiene becomes a problem. And you can see that middle picture, the picture of the three kids. When we had finished visiting the first family, we came out and these are neighbours' kids um, from the hill. There were six kids in their family and they lived in the same sized house, a one-roomed house with no running water, no kitchen. And there was eight of them living there. So during the day, the parents would just kick them out of the house and they had to fend for themselves because... Seriously, who wants six kids in a house when it's the size of my kitchen? Um, particularly, you know, active kids. But it meant that they were out on the streets fending for themselves. They were not washed. Their clothes were not clean. And they were not given food when they were kicked out of the house to go and spend the day. They were scavenging for food. And the coordinator who visits this village Every single day, he was almost in tears telling me about this family. The family are not interested in the sort of help that we provide because our expectation is that they have to work towards self-sufficiency. They've got to put the effort in. The parents were so hopeless. They're dealing with alcohol addiction and they saw no way of getting out of the situation that they were in and so their kids were suffering. In the top right-hand corner, you can see a little classroom there with some kids. This is not a school. This is the Mission Without Borders um, centre, which was right next door to the church. And kids can come there. It's particularly for kids who are in our program to come there for an after-school club. At after-school club, they get help with their homework. A lot of their parents are illiterate. So the parents are no help whatsoever. Also, when you're living in one of these one-roomed houses with nothing, where are you going to sit? How are you going to do your homework? Who's going to help you? So they come and they do their homework at the centre. There are toilets. There are showers. They can shower there. There are washing machines. They can wash their clothes there. And they get food. 
For them, it's a safe place off the streets, a safe place to be, and it's run by our organisation together with the church. And that is how we hope to change lives, to help bring them out of poverty. But there are a lot of families in this situation and for some of them, domestic violence is a big issue as well because of alcohol, because of the poverty and the stress the parents are under. Some of these kids come to the after-school program because it's the safe place to be where they can be themselves. There are very much needs in the world, even if we don't see them in our own community. And we have this hope that when we are a sharing community, that we can be like that early church, where God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy person amongst them. We have needs here in Sydney. We have needy people in our community. Sometimes we don't see it. And if you can't find needy people here, you will certainly find needy people elsewhere. I want to share some positive stories with you too because sharing what we have really transforms lives in ways you would not believe. This uh, is Rumen. He and his wife, Katya, have been a part of our program for a while and they have been sponsored as a family from um, a group in Norway. So a group of Christians in Norway um, were willing to share money um, and to share other things too. Because they're close by, they can send truckloads of clothing and other things um, to Bulgaria. And it has completely transformed Ruman's life. Ruman, um, five or six years ago, was completely illiterate, living in one room with his wife and two daughters. He could only work for six months of the year because he was working on farms and, you know, they have heavy snow through winter. So, when you're a farm worker um, and just a day labourer, really, you only get paid for the days where you work. So his family had no money, no income for six months of the year and they were getting desperate. His wife, Katya, had a basic um, primary school education but nothing more than that. So they approached our organisation and asked to join us. We um, got them sponsored, as I said, from a group in Norway and um, as part of the sponsorship, there's somebody, a local person from the local church um, who would go and visit them every month and spend time with them and bring them big boxes of food but also hygiene products, soap, cleaning products, things like that to help them so they don't have to pay for it. Over time, Ruman and Katya got employment. They got a job in a factory. They were still illiterate, but um, they worked really hard through their employment They and continuing to receive these food parcels meant that they could save a little bit of money, so they added two rooms to their house. I got to go and visit. They asked me over for tea, so I went and had a cup of tea with them. It's a lovely place compared to the previous house. I didn't take any photos just for their privacy, but they did have a kitchen and they did have a bathroom. And they had two other rooms where they could um, could invite people over and also sleep. They now have three children. Their youngest was only two months old. His name's um, Abraham, very cute little boy. And they served me tea and it was lovely. It wasn't just a journey, though, of becoming financially sustainable. It was a journey of faith because this is a Muslim village. In Bulgaria. A lot of people in the south of Bulgaria are Muslim. And they realised that the help was coming from the church. Now, we don't have an expectation that they have to join the church, but they are invited to come along to church things. They became believers through it. They Somebody shared faith with them, not just how to f handle their finances. They now volunteer at the church and want to be a blessing to their community. To really become self-sufficient, they approached us and said, we want to be able to start a shop. So this is the shop that they started. It is called the Jehovah Jairus Supermarket. See the sign up there? 
It's an expression of their faith and God's provision for them through the worldwide church. Their supporters in Norway supplied the equipment in the church, but they have to do everything else themselves. And it's been up and running since October. Business is still good. It is smack bang in the centre of their village and people are coming there not only to buy eggs and ice creams and things like that. People are coming and hearing the gospel when they come and visit. They've put a little coffee machine. It's like one of those Audi coffee machines in the corner and I don't know how much they charge people but it would be minimal. And they're now building a little space out the front in the centre of their town where people can drink the coffee and hang out and talk and do community together. It's a welcoming place. And Roman drives a car that he takes people to church in every Sunday. He's sharing what he has had. He's received people from people who were sharing and now he is sharing to others. And they've got people coming to faith in that community because everybody knows what his life was like before and how God has transformed him and how he was part of a bigger worldwide community of believers. Last story I want to share with you is this guy. And no matter how much I am over time, I'm not over time yet, I'm still going to share this story because this guy inspires me no end. This is Marion. Try not to get emotional. Marion um, Marion was found as a baby in a rubbish bin. He had been dumped by his birth mother. He was taken to an orphanage where he grew up his entire childhood in an orphanage. He is intellectually disabled. His life was hard in the orphanage, but as a child he um, was sponsored by our organisation as well. So he would have... Um, regular visits from a coordinator who would get the, together the children from the orphanage who had sponsors and run Christian programs with them. They would bring food to the orphanage so that there was enough for the kids to eat. They would bring clothing. They would bring things that were needed um, to the orphanage that were shared amongst all the children, not just the, the sponsored ones. Um, but the sponsored kids particularly got to do something every summer. They would go to summer camp which is a program that we run, for a week they got to be part of a community where volunteers from churches, and I'm talking about hundreds of volunteers from churches, would bring together about a 1,000 kids in groups, not all at one time, and run a week-long Christian camp where they had showers, they had hot meals, they, um, they had games, they got to play, but they also heard the Bible. And it was at one of those summer camps that Marion gave his life to Christ. He has recently become an adult, which means he can no longer live at the orphanage. So he has been moved into a group support home um, not far from where we, we met at the, um, the church. He um, lives there with other people. The local council provided him with a job. His job is to pick up rubbish off the street. He, um, he loves his job because it gives him opportunities to share about Jesus with other people. I couldn't believe it when I heard this. His face lit up and he says, I tell people at work about Jesus. Every afternoon when he's finished work, he comes to the Mission Without Borders Centre and he um, volunteers. He helps at the church to hand out soup at the soup kitchen. He helps with um, doing some gardening around the place and tidying up and he loves it. For him, the church is his family, the family he never had. While I was there, I was with the director from Bulgaria for our organisation and um, Marion came up to him and said, can I talk to you privately for a minute? Obviously in Bulgarian, I had no idea, somebody translated. Um, and the director came to me afterwards and he said, do you know what Marion just wanted to ask me? He asked if he could go and volunteer at summer camp this year so that he can bless other kids the way he was blessed when he went to summer camp. 
when I think of the list of excuses that I put together for myself, my goodness, I look at somebody like Marion and I think I've got no excuse. He has next to nothing and yet he shares his life. He's been rejected and he doesn't let it get to him. He still shares. He has so little and he still shares because he knows Jesus and Jesus has changed his life. So I'm going to ask you, to now share with somebody next to you. I'm sorry if this is a little bit threatening, but we cannot be a sharing community unless we take risks. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes now to turn to somebody next to you and to think what are the things that you need to share? What's God been speaking to you about? And maybe you even need to mention some of the things that are holding you back. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about feeling guilty for the things that you can't share. Don't feel guilty when God has not given you something, you cannot share it. I cannot stand up here and lead worship because God has not given me the ability to sing. I'm not going to feel guilty about that. For some of you, I realise that you don't have a lot of time. Sharing time and volunteering can be hard. For others, maybe financially, things are hard. And you don't have anything to share. So have a look and see what does God want you to share. Not of the things that you can't share, but what are the things that God might be calling you to share? Because even if you've got nothing else, you can share your struggles. And what what is it to be a sharing community? We're going to give you a couple of minutes and then the band is going to come up and, and sing. And then at the end we'll pray. But for now... Turn to somebody else, share with them, and if you've still got time, also pray for each other. We'll just give you a couple of minutes. There are some things that we commonly do in our church to be a sharing community, and so I really encourage you now to consider doing some of these things. Firstly, if you would like prayer today, if anything has touched your heart, if you've got something that you need to share about, we've got some people who will pray for you down over this side. If you've got struggles that you need to share about, if you've been challenged and you need to talk about it, or if you've got anything else going on in your life, don't hold back because we are a community where you can share what's going on for you in your life and you can be prayed for and ministered to. We've also got morning tea. It's a great place to share with people there. Talk to people talk to new people and there's also a photo booth out there today especially for Mother's Day share with your family, enjoy that I believe you will be able to get a, um, a photo to take away one for each family, is that right Jess? one for each family enjoy that, enjoy the community being community together now let me pray for you this prayer may the Lord bless you and keep you May he make your face to shine upon you and may he give you peace. May he use you as a blessing to others and may you be blessed by this community of followers of Jesus. Amen.